Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining. Uh, I'm going to start with our first speaker, uh, Dr. Rabab al uh, She's an Arabic language program coordinator and English language lecturer at the Royal College of Surgeon in Ireland Medical University of Bahrain. Uh, she's passionate about supporting the visibility of Arabic language research in the global research market by taking over some initiative and sustainable project in this field. Uh, the floor is yours, Rabab. So uh, good afternoon, uh, colleagues and everybody. Uh, so I'm happy here to just like present like certain things and share with you certain ideas, challenges uh, about Arabic uh, language research. Uh, my paper uh, name is the most common challenges to Arabic translation and also localization. Uh, we're talking about like current and also we're talking about the future uh, future position or vision of Arabic scientific research in the era of uh, the uh, technology, AI, and also the existence of open access research. So I'm welcoming you from Bahrain, the, uh, the land of civilization and the pearl of the, uh, uh, of course, of the Gulf. And we have these civilization, Bahrain, Dilmon, Tylos, and Arados. These are the name of civilizations, uh, old civilizations in Bahrain until we have this title like Bahrain. So nowadays, not only Arab like translators and interpreter, but also Arab writers and journalists often face a difficulty in choosing like between the correct language and what is understandable. So something like to be, for example, like easy and understandable at the same uh, time to audience when it comes to Arabic terminology and also phrases equivalent in meaning to other languages. This especially happens in the emerging fields of modern sciences and also the new technology or AI, as you would like to call it. The role of sustainable translation and localization is very significant to enable Arab from different parts of the world to learn about the latest worldwide knowledge and manuscripts, of course, in various areas of sciences, because language, as you know, is a barrier. So if there is a language barrier, then of course they will not be open to other uh, research and uh, I mean like produced in different languages. On the second flip of the coin, a translation of Arabic language and sciences would also help in uh, exposing the non-Arab world to the uh, to the Arab, of course, here, knowledge, treasure, and the word opened also the door to uh, more research collaboration and knowledge partnership between Arab and the non-Arab uh, scientists. They can be, for example, researchers, scholars, and uh, entrepreneurship, uh, entrepreneurs, and decision makers as well. This conference paper discusses a crucial research issue, which is the shortage of quality online Arabic research content and also the most significant factors that had caused burying this rich Arabic treasure. And also this treasure is prevented from being visible worldwide to the audience. And also it will prevent it from having like opportunities such as benefiting from the open science access research features and be uh, having like, for example, like credits to these like researchers. This paper also has a dual role by presenting the problem, the challenges, of course, and it's various like dimensions and also raising critical questions for a round table discussion, not like a physical round table discussion could be in the coffee break because I know about like the timing to seek possible solutions and recommendations from the mind of interested experts like you, scholars, research and decision makers who come from different parts of the MENA uh, region to this conference for more Arabic research visibility and credibility in the era of open access research. And also this paper is looking for forming realistic, not only presenting or sharing the challenges, but also through, from this stage, we are trying to call for realistic actionable policies to be implement, implemented, to push the Arabic research work forward, uh, to see the light of the modern research knowledge and to take also its position that it deserves. That is here something I 
I really like from uh, what Dr. Mohammed Atiya from the British University in Dubai mentioned in his publication that is entitled Arabic Language Nature and Challenges, 2012. Living languages are just living. And new leaves appear, constantly changing. So these leaves like from being like greenish, then little bit will become like yellowish, like old language, old terms. Now they are not in use. Some of them or most of them are not in use. So there should be a new terminology added to these like Arabic uh, dictionaries and encyclopedias. They may grow old and die, which means these terms, terminology, because people are not using them, some of the terminology. That's why they are not in use and they are dead now. So other new ones should be replacing them. They may be reborn. A new terminology may come also to the uh, stage. And new languages may appear, which means languages are not static, but they are active. So each time they are renewable. We add to them. We have the basis. Some of them we can, I mean, like exclude them and we can just like consider them as part of like old era, for example, uh, because no, uh, they are uh, not used. But the uh, other ones can be uh, can have here, for example, uh, additional a new terminology, especially the one in the field of sciences and technology, which is w used worldwide. Now we'll focus on the challenge, and I would like to like to focus on these challenges. Try to focus with me on these challenges. The word tragedy translation in Arabic, because we are talking about translation. Versus localization. Some people they mix between translation and uh, localization. So the word tragedy translation in Arabic is not a tragedia. Like in some lots of like Arabic publications, we have the tragedia, we have the drama, for example, and if they are like written in Arabic alphabet, but they are originally they are not Arabic words, right? Uh, in Arabic, we call it meesat, tragedy. Like the word uh, pedagogical translation in Arabic is not pedagogia, but ta'limi wa tarbawi, but people are now used to it. They are writing them in using Arabic alphabet and they, they become a part of the language. But some people still, they are confused if they don't know their meaning exactly because they don't exist, they don't have roots in Arabic language. They are so different. They are borrowed from other languages. The same thing would be applied on the open access research, a new ter terminology, like the Arabic dictionaries, like such new terms that needs a huge effort to put. It's not like a small effort. It needs like a huge effort of melting heads of all experts and researchers in the field to be melted in one pot. So they, they will come up with, of course, here brilliant work that we can publish it uh, uh, in the international stage. We can share it internationally. Especially for those people who are like monolingual Arab researchers who speak only their own language Arabic. It will be very difficult to them. So media professionals often have to choose between accuracy and also the ease, right? We need something understandable. And also we would like to ensure that what terms we are using are also accurate in Arabic. And it's very difficult here. And the choice between the correct and clear language is usually difficult here, especially in the emerging of the fields and modern sciences where term terminology is shaped almost daily. Like we have a new termolo terminology uh, added according to the development of these sciences. We must also here quickly deal with the translated texts, as we may not have enough time, like some time to, uh, for example, to look into it, to review it before publishing it, or before, for example, sharing it with other audience or readers, right? And in, in this case, of course, there will be here some inaccurate information or terms or phrases, structures are used. Added to that, the spread of information and technology illiteracy among many people in the Arab world. Sometimes it's because 
when when say the technology like the new things are published or shared in other languages than Arabic. That's why there is a barrier for those monolingual uh, uh, Arab, both that speak Arab. They can't be, they can't be exposed, for example, there is no translation to their language, for example, provided uh, of these publications, so they can't understand their, what the other words are uh, doing, for example, what sort of inventions are happening, right? Uh, so, as well as also talking about the economical or the social, for example, level, like in poor developing countries where the ownership of some digital devices like laptops, mobiles, or PCs or iPads, and also the Wi Fi or internet if it is not available to them. So, again, the language and also the financial part is also considered there are a specific value to them. So this is another challenge. The weak infra uh, infrastructure of internet network that we have in Arab economy, uh, and the weak financial level of majority of our people prevent them from benefiting from being present in the digital world. Even their work is published like in, uh, I mean, in any, for example, in uh, some social forums where people that like sharing opinions, no reliable, uh, let's say, information. Uh, no reliable information shared uh, uh, through these like platforms. They are not secure sometimes, and plagiarism is there as well for uh, huge work done by uh, really well-known uh, researchers. But their work is loose in these platforms, which is viewed at the lower economic levels as the intellectual luxury. As well as another challenge is the absence of the role of universities research centers, like in the Arab world, in digitizing manuscripts, for example, and the studies uh, and research conducted in these institutions, especially the one conducted through Arabic language, the dissemination and also the sharing of these manuscripts to uh, in other international databases or platform. There is a shortage, there is a barrier. Weak publishing activity and absence of distribution network uh, for a new Arabic publications. What we have like on shelves are all, or like most of them, are very old publications, especially in the field of science. If you go to literature, for example, there are some publications, but still not visible, new ones. When it comes to science, it's very difficult to find like a new good publication in Arabic language. And even if there are some, they are not uh, visible to the other world. The spread of what is known as like a Franco-Arab or a Franco-Arabic. This one is like writing, as we said, like in the first example, using English letters, for example, or any other languages letters to write, like for example, an Arabic word. We write Arabic through different other languages, uh, letters or alphabets. And in here, the uh, of course, uh, the identity of Arabic language is missing. It will harm the language. As well as the absence of reliable encyclopedias that has reliable and accurate, for example, knowledge that is also secured in information or in saving information, if you would like to save your work or disseminate your work, such as like the MOOCs, for example, which is uh, the massive open online courses. So we'd like, like to have like such things also in Arabic language and we have shortage of these. As we said, like mostly are like forums and like these like personal sites that only share like all like opinions of people. Uh, these challenges or obstacles have greatly affected digital Arabic content, which is neither constant, uh, consistent and all nor here appropriate with the value and also the importance of the beautiful language. It's a very rich language and deserves more. So it doesn't have the cultural or the historical also part is missing uh, as a first language because it was the first language for uh, science and knowledge in the old era, in the golden age of knowledge and sciences. So lots of scholars uh, work is also missed. We, a uh, new generation, didn't continue. 
or maybe if they continue, still they have obstacles. Developing digital Arabic content requires also basic information tools that rely on the comput computerizing the Arabic language, analyzing it in accurate, practical manner should be. The most important of these tools are also such engines and dictionaries. Uh, and we have here also, uh, we have only like all dictionaries and these dictionaries, even like the new one, but uh, they don't include the new terminology uh, in uh, different fields, especially like science and uh, the upcoming science and technology terminology are not added to these dictionaries. We need to uh, research into how to design also and create dictionaries. And we started with knowledge E also, uh, putting the glossary, which is a good step, let's say here, a glossary and uh, step by step, we have a mini dictionary or a full dictionary of open access, for example, research and also technology, terminology in Arabic language that can help a big layer of researchers. Arabic language faces many lexical problems as well, despite the great efforts of lots of scholars have been made here and being made by language academies in several Arab countries. The problem that they are mostly like individual, as I said here, individual initiatives and efforts. So these initiatives should be adopted by uh, let's say here, very famous uh, entities, so it can come to the light, it can, uh, for example, achieve its goal uh, to, to, to go to the international uh, cycle. Arabic language learners and researchers have very also large and old dictionaries. For example, like if I'm talking about like old dictionaries, we have Taj al arus and Taj al Arus is one of these like old scholars uh, published by old scholar, Arab scholars uh, and uh, researchers. It's about like 40 parts and each part has like 500 pages. Like to search, for example, for, uh, let's say here a word, you need here to, um, to read like 50 pages, for example, like to understand its origin, its root, and the word has like lots of synonyms and you have to be selective and select like the word that exactly give you the meaning in the, it depends on the context, and it depends on the meaning, so you have to be selective. And like, like the Google Translate will translate word to word and sometimes will give you like funny translation or something that doesn't have like meaning so we can't rely on the google translation a human translation should be like in between you can take it as like hints for example it will give you hints it will help you yes but then as a human being you should put the effort and restructure it the large gap between us and the advanced world in modern science and technology and our lateness to keep pace because of the obstacles of course not because of people with its developments and the terms and expression that accompany them. The great richness of Arabic voc vocabulary make uh, research difficult. And we, we saw this like when we uh, I mean, like worked together in the glossary with Dr. Emily uh, to put like an Arabic glossary for open access research. There were like lots of, I mean, each uh, researcher like came up with different terminology for one term, for example, turning it to Arabic. And when, and then we have like to agree like together on the last option, for example, there should be like at least one option so people will not be confused. And uh, that was not uh, an easy thing, of course, I have to make an agreement. The nature of Arabic language differs from most like foreign other languages, like in terms of writing it like from right to left, for example, and in terms of its reliance on the root, always we uh, try to go to the root of the word, not the word itself, and understand it, and then understand the other word that comes from the root. So it's like a long journey to understand uh, a single term. Summarizing the challenges, in the field of translation, it is necessary to emphasize the importance of coordinating or coordination between various linguistic academies and make a decision to unify the translation 
uh, of foreign words because if we have like different uh, translation as we said here confusion will be increased so we need the support of these like entities. Uh, yesterday we had like the UNESCO like uh, strategy, which is good here, a good step. And we can also refer to the Arabic language as part of the uh, agenda and find like some solutions. Arabic terms need a huge efforts and special care for their richness and depth and meaning. Now we were coming to the stage of calling for recommendations and some strategies here uh, to the creation of an Arabic or Arab digital content industry by strengthening the information infrastructure in a way that is compatible uh, with the Arab linguistic and cultural also specifications because we have here the cultural uh, aspects come hand in hand with the language. So if you're talking about the language of if you are translating, you have also to consider the cultural aspect of the language in any languages, of course, not only Arabic. And this is, needs like a good efforts and experts in the field. So the historical and cultural importance of the uh, Baad language, Arabic language, we call it the Baad language because this uh, sound is unique sound for Arabic language. It doesn't exist like in other languages. That's why they call it the, the Baad language highlights the historical depth and organic connection of the Arabic language with other languages and also civilizations, the uh, connotations as well as the geostrategic dimensions of this language. So as we said here, for example, the cultural heritage part is very important as well as the problems and gaps that Arabic language faces on the internet, it occupies a growing position in terms of a presence and use on the internet. It is also classified as the seventh or eighth language, like uh, among like other international languages used by lots of uh, people and speakers. And the introduction, so diverse, uh, deserves, sorry, uh, being added to these digital platforms, because you can see, like, if you go to any digital platform that has, like, databases or research or whatever, uh, platforms for uh, research collaboration, when you click on the options, you see different international languages, but you miss the Arabic. And sometimes we have, like, some limited features that we can put, for example, in Arabic content, but still there will be some problems, for example, the written work will be from, uh, let's say here, left to right, but it's written in Arabic. Sometimes you have codes for certain words. The platform will not uh, recognize these Arabic letters or some terms. And this is, of course, here, I mean, like, bring us even, like, problem. Even in our institution, sometimes we face the same when we put exams, like me, for example, if I put exams in pure Arabic, uh, then, of course, there are limited features for me to be used. So I have to switch and find alternative just like to make it fit to the students. And uh, if the introduction of the Internet has enhanced these connotations and dimensions as it is strength capabilities of the Arabic language and its interaction with other, of course, languages and culture. And this is what we would like to do. So Arabic language should also interact with uh, the new, of course, with the new terms, with other, other cultures and languages. And so uh, are the uh, Arab researchers. Okay, I'll just try to wrap up. Yeah. So I'll take you to the end. Yeah. Solving these like issue of communications and computer infra uh, infrastructure and the problems of digitizing the Arabic language, we have creating an Arabic industry for digital content by strengthening the information and communication and infrastructure, imposing the region's needs on hardware and software manuf uh, uh, um, manufacturers, of course. This is what we need. We need also to go to those manufacturers. We have the, the knowledge, yes, but we need to attract those people in the uh, technology field so we can work together in teams, like the technology field and also the, the those like experts in knowledge in Arabic language and research. 
and then we can come up with good uh, platform that can suit us uh, and also suit the international, uh, of course, criteria. Establishing a three-dimensional Arabic uh, uh, digital base. This is what we, uh, I mean, need. Consist uh, consisting of three portals should be like, for example, the Arabic digital education portal, Arabic digital uh, infrastructure, and also digital library portal, the modern Arabic translation campaign portal. So I'll also here refer to something like if we did because the, any problem has roots, and if we would like to, uh, of course, here to uh, get rid of any plant that has like causing us like problems, even like at home, we have to cut the roots. So we get, uh, uh, I mean, like we uh, try like to prevent it like forever. If we get rid of it. So the same thing here, we have to go to the roots. Where is the roots, for example, from where we start, right? Uh, if we talk about higher education level, for example, in terms of Arabic language, so the new generation will be, we are like preparing the new generation to be ready to make us these like design these platforms uh, to have like these specifications and features that can suit us and that can bring us to the international stage. So local or international universities, higher education institution in both Arab and non-Arab world and their Arabic language departments must consider redesigning their Arabic language modules, curricula, in a way that meets the academic and also the professional needs of the local, not only local, but regional and also international career market, including the open access research. As well as here, uh, like for example, in terms of Arabic language, how can we have, for example, those people who are ready to design these like platforms, deal with Arabic research, deal with uh, connect Arabic research with other languages research, for example, Arabic language should be more specialized, which means designed to be taught for specific academic purposes. Uh, Arabic language graduates should be ready to graduate to become not only teachers, not only lecturers, but professional translators. We need interpreters, we need teachers, university lecturers, professional editors, reviewers, proofreaders, Arabic language-based research leaders, famous authors, legal reviewers, Arabic countries, ambassadors, media directors, cultural council, and professional Arabic uh, broadcaster and designer, electronic or AI Arabic language games and platforms for teaching, learning, and research designers. This is what we would like to prepare the new generation for if they are specialized in the language. So the language is not limited only for teaching. Talking uh, just briefly about, I will not talk about AI like in, uh, in depth, but I'm just like bringing something here just quickly, uh, Dr. Betul, excuse me. And uh, yeah. So this is the, uh, we're talking about GBT and also uh, Google Bird. Google Bird also is uh, an invention that is used for communication, using like different languages, entering, for example, a language communication, certain communication written one, for example, in uh, a language and then turning it into Arabic. So Arabic is added to it and it could also to, uh, speak like different languages, could recognize uh, some accents, some Arabic accents, like for example, Emirati could be Egyptian, uh, for example, accent. And when it translates, when it talks as a reply, it will turn it to the uh, uh, classical Arabic, the standard Arabic, which is understood by all Arab from different Arab region. But of course, they have limitation, like both the chat GBT is also integrated with the bird. Google Bird. So when it works, it works with the chat GBT as well. But as we said here, of course, the human brain and control are needed to ensure a high level of accuracy to be culturally and ethically safe. So not 100% to rely on these inventions. They are good, but the human should be there to control it and to improve it. So these are the features of both, right? Most advanced, used for most advanced AI language models currently available, designed to process natural language, provide intelligence responses, both have some limitations. 
and most are used by business and organization to deal with the clients, but we can use it for research also to collaborate, like research collaboration between researchers, like Arab researchers and non-Arab researchers. That can be very helpful. And what I'm just like piloting are these like platforms. Quickly, Dr. Betul is looking at me, staring at me. Um, I'm very scared, <laughs> Dr. Betul. We have the Ice Spring Learn and Ice Spring Suite. I bought these licenses to pilot them. Inshallah, the next coming here, I will show you here the uh, the results. I'm using them because I heard that they have added the Arabic language as an option. So, uh, of course, I uh, try here to use them for research collaboration and research work. And, of course, we'll update you in the second or the third annual. <laughs> sure. And of course, in the coffee break, you are welcome to talk about the, to make like a SWOT analysis, but a verbal one. And thank you so much. If you have any question after my colleague, of course. Thank you so much for the wonderful talk. I can't agree more, like we have to redesign our Arabic language modules. There's a lot of challenges, difficulties. Yeah, I'm looking forward to the discussion actually after that. Uh, I want to introduce our second speaker, uh, Dr. Jessica Malouk is the Director of Strategy Research and Bank at Sheikh Saud bin Saqr Al Qasimi Foundation for Policy Research. She's also served at the advisory board of Ras Al Khaima Medical and Health Science University. College of Nursing and Ras Al Khaimah Academy. She's passionate about conducting research that would positively impact the children and education system. Yeah, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you very much for the introduction. My name is Jessica Maloch. Um, I'm the Director of Strategy, Research and Impact at the Al Qasimi Foundation. We are a small think and do tank that works on the social, economic, and cultural um, development of Ras Al Khaima, the UAE, and the region. Um, for those of you who don't know, Ras Al Khaima is the northernmost emirate in the UAE, and it stands for top of the tent um, <laughs> in, in Arabic. Um, we do, uh, we work on the development um, through our programs our human capacity building, our arts and culture programs, and our research. And our research is specifically designed to inform decision-making. And by the nature of our research, we would like to make it as accessible and easy as possible. And we do this through our open access publications. Um, our policy briefs, our reports, our fact sheets are all posted bilingually in English and Arabic on our website, as well as in the JSTOR repository of think tanks. Um, and we also have a academic journal, which I'm going to talk specifically about today, which is the Gulf Education and Social Policy Review, which is an, um, a, a, a journal attached to our Gulf Comparative and Education Society, which was founded in 2008, which is a society of academics that come together um, from across the region. Actually, we're going to be meeting next week in case you're interested in Russell Kema. Um, from the 1st to the 3rd of November. So today I want to take a little bit of a deep dive into the themes from yesterday and talk a little bit about accessibility, sustainability, and inclusivity, and in specifically with regards to language in open access. Nope. Ha. There we go. All right, so yesterday um, I was very inspired by Professor Shemi's um, comments when she talked about how multilingualism is a strength of the region. Um, that was really inspiring to me, and I, I really believe that. But I think so often that there is a push for recognition in higher education in this globalized world that there's a push to get citations, to get promotions, and so we tend to, English tends to dominate our um, higher education landscape. Um, you know, 
and in some ways, um, I'm not going to push any ideology on anyone today. Don't worry. <laughs> but in some ways, this is a really positive thing. I mean, we're all here coming across the world um, and being able to communicate with each other with ease in a lingua franca that we all know relatively well. And so it does have a lot of advantages. Um, and it also allows us, we've talked a lot, a lot about collaboration in the last couple of days. And that also the language barrier is reduced when we all speak in one language, one common language to be able to collaborate with each other with ease. Um, so although English, see that? Um, although English is the lingua franca, we also have a language disparity uh, or a status disparity that we should probably address um, that between English as sort of the lingua franca that we're all speaking here today and the official and native language of the region, which is Arabic. Now, in the UAE, um, higher education is predominantly in English, okay? And there is talk on and off all the time with K-12 education and how K-12 education needs to prepare students for English. And often it's an either or combat um, between how much English language they need to get and how much Arabic they need to get. And so there have been initiatives in the last couple of years um, sort of to promote more Arabic because there's the sense that native Arabic speakers are losing their language, um, that there is not only a language um, deficit, but there's also sort of a culture and identity problem that goes along with it. Um, and with this difference, um, it's not just as sort of the literature talks about, it's not just about words and letters and whether you're writing from left to right or from right to left. Uh, there's also epistemological challenges about cultural traditions, academic method or academic culture methodologies, and even just approaches to knowledge production. So I think one of the results is that academics in the region, for a variety of reasons, um, some of which I've just talked about, um, tend to write in Arabic. Um, and academics that want to write in Arabic or can only write in Arabic have limited access to high ranking publications. Okay, and the result of this is that there's restricted capacity to enhance academic capital um, at the individual level. And really, I would argue, in some senses, long term, this is kind of an unsustainable ecosystem in the way, um, because we're not actually talking about the native language that is perpetuating here um, on the ground. Okay. So, but at the same time, I don't have any big answers for you all today. I'm just posing a lot of questions. So I hope that's okay with everybody. Um, but at the same time, I want to point out that this Arabic English debate that seems to perpetuate is really in a lot of ways, a false dichotomy. I don't think it needs to be an either or. Um, and I think open access is actually a great way to address, to be a both and inclusive. It's an ideal situation. And in his keynote yesterday, Dr. Salvatore mentioned about the guidelines of having no barriers to participate, including language in our open access principles. So in light of that, today I want to talk about a project that um, we at the Acosmi Foundation are engaged in and sort of look at a case study of sort of the opportunities and challenges that presents with our um, our journal, which is the Gulf Education and Social Policy Review. So this um, journal, which we call Gesper in-house, is a pretty new journal. Um, it was just established in 2019. And um, it had its inaugural issue in January of 2020. And we currently publish two issues a year. We have several strategic goals with um, under the umbrella of this journal. The first is to ensure the highest of quality. We have a double blind peer review process and we have an academic board um, of international academics um, 
also drawing from the local and the regional talent as well. So it's a wide range of, of experts. We um, have a strategic goal of promoting accessibility. So we embrace open access policies. Um, all of our publications or all the issues and publications and manuscripts are, um, are open access on the Knowledge E platform. And we have, it is a bilingual publication, and that's what I'm going to focus mostly on today. So we publish in both Arabic and English. That means that authors can go and submit Arabic and English articles and go through a parallel peer review process, okay, of of their, their peers, um, and then have it published and be accessible in either Arabic or English. And this is really with the aim to reduce linguistic barriers um, for this group of academics that are interested in education and social policy. So today I want to sort of take a little bit more of a deep dive and to understand what is happening in relating relating to these strategic goals and how um, specifically with the bilingual element of this journal. So to do that, we um, employed a mixed method approach. So we looked at the quantitative data, both um, related to the article metrics and performance statistics, which I'll show you in a minute. And we also went and reached out to our key stakeholders, our editors, our reviewers, our advisory board members, and um, asked them both in, um, and interviews as well as questionnaires to um, talk about their perceptions about the language policy and um, language barriers in general and challenges and opportunities um, within this project of the Gulf Education and Social Policy Review. So initially, just to give you an overview, in three years, we have published 30 articles. As you see, the vast majority of them are in English. And this is indicative of the fact that people actually, this is what people have submitted. Okay, we've only been able to publish four um, Arabic, Arabic manuscripts, which is really about 13% of our total um, of our total manuscripts, which is not really a lot. Okay. Um, just to give you kind of um just a, a relative perception. Um, the submission rate for Arabic manuscripts is slightly higher, so we have a slightly higher rejection rate of around 25%. Okay. But however, and what I found most surprising and very, very enlightening and positive was the fact that when we look at the performance metrics, although you, we do not have many Arabic publications that are being published through the journal that they are actually quite attractive to the readership. So when we look at abstracts viewed, we see that although not, not statistically significant, I want to be very, very transparent with that, um, that Ar the Arabic um, abstract views are quite high and relatively on par with the English. And that is also the case with the downloads. So this is really suggestive that there is appetite for Arabic speaking publication or Arabic language publications, high quality um, in, in the community. Okay. How, oh, and this is the figure to go with it. However, um, when we actually asked our key stakeholders, um, we noticed that this is really not reflexive or this posit the positive readership is not really reflexive in the key stakeholders. Um, so the perceptions are really still related around fear and hesitancy to publish in, in Arabic due to a variety of challenges. Um, there is the idea of the, um, there's the global academic consumption there's the institutional dynamics, and there are definitely some challenges that I'll talk about a little bit more in depth. Okay. Um, I think one that's very, very interesting here, so there's the translation quality. Um, they talk about the perceptions of a limited audience, which is actually is not technically the case of which I just showed you, but there is still that perception that there is only going to be a limited audience and they will not be able to actually expand their their readership or their citations of what um, is required of them as academics. 
um, they are worried or hesitant because of the impact factor um, and the overall impact of the article itself. And there also, um, there's also some fear and hesitation, um, especially among the editorial board about standardization of terminology and expertise within the review process. If we look, take a little more macro view, we see that, um, you know, these are, this is nothing new to anybody in this room. And in fact, these are, are some of the themes that we've been talking about in the last couple of days um, quite heavily the um the the economic um necessity of that that academics feel that they need to publish in english because it is the global um the language of global communication and um it is important for their market value as um academics and they also point to the push from their institutions themselves to be going and publishing in english so that it reaches a wider audience so that being said, um, I think that there is a light at the end of the tunnel um, for having this multilingual um, journal. Um, I haven't given up complete hope. And in fact, I'm quite optimistic um, that moving forward, we can we do have a vibrant audience for um, Arabic publications. And I think we are looking to address some of those challenges from academics that potentially could publish in Arabic um, and want to publish in Arabic, but are hesitant because of the, the, the aspects I just mentioned. So what we're planning to do is um, we are looking to do more promotion of our Arabic articles. Um, we are going to look to partner with um, academic institutions in the research community in the Gulf region and specifically targeting um, graduate students and junior faculty to sort of try and look and promoting how they, we can create a more multilingual ecosystem. And I think I'll just stop there. And thank you for your attention. And um, I look forward to our discussion. Thank you so much. That was a fantastic talk. I love the new model of like, yeah, uh, being able to publish both in English and Arabic. That's very, very interesting. Uh, I've got so many questions, but I think I'm going to start with the audience. Yeah, Emily. Yeah. So thank you both. That was really, really interesting. Um, Jessica, I have a question for you. Uh, not least, so sort of combining both both of the hats that I wear, which is working phonology and, and form is obviously I publish your journal. <laughs> this was really interesting to see as as the client to see how how you know as the journal board and everything how you uh, are engaging with the data that we're producing and and the the service we provide. And I guess what I want to ask is both as a publisher, so not just us specifically, but publishers in general, uh, open access publishers uh, for the region, of which admittedly there are not that many, and as the forum initiative is there anything that as publishers we can do to help encourage people to be publishing in arabic because i agree you know we, we're constantly trying to promote the the language visibility of research from this region and and increase its discoverability and encourage people to publish in arabic and every time we get a new client the first thing they say is oh no we want it to be english language not arabic and but we want to promote both as as the publisher we want to promote the arabic language but also as form, we want to promote the Arabic language. So on both sides, the sort of the supportive role and the publishing role, is there anything that institutions and organizations can do um, from that more non-journal owner side? There we go. Okay. Yes. You know, I, I what what we're seeing and what the data showed us um, is really that this is sort of a grassroots issue. It's um, it's a mentality issue at a lot of levels. Um, but I think so. I think that that is probably a way to start um, to be able to um, work with academics themselves. As I was saying, it's our recommendation. That's going to be our next step. Um, so that really needs to, there needs to be a voice that's coming from academics that says, okay, 
we can publish in both. It doesn't have to be an either or. Um, and we want to be able to publish in both because we're a multilingual society in the end. Um, but I also think that needs to be coupled with a more systemic institutional approach because you do have this push from institutions for the promotions, the citations, the impact, all of that. Um, so that there also needs to be sort of middle and high level conversations about changing policy um, at, at the institution, even the national level. Um, and it, it's it's kind of also, if you go even one step higher, it's, it's really about a debate that seems, or a, a discussion, I'll be nice and say it's conversation, <laughs> At, 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 at the national level that we've been having here in the region um, for, for a number of years about, you know, the need to be part of the global economy and to be a knowledge society, but also to um, to maintain our roots. Right. And there's this constant pull and, and language has a lot to do with that. And so I think that's maybe one way to, to begin the conversation is to say, OK, we, we have these two these two things that we need to balance here in, in the UAE or in the Gulf or in the wider region um, that um, that need, we need to address both of them. And so let's see if we can see how we can do this. I don't know if that answers your question, but those are my thoughts. Yeah. Well, uh, would like to, um... Thank you so much. And just would like to add and to elaborate on the same uh, talking about like Bahrain. Uh, I mean, like in the past, like years ago, we had like in some university, like Bahrain University and the Arabian Gulf University for medicine and also for other uh, specialization, they they have their own journals. And within their journals, they produce like both the uh, Arabic, the pure Arabic research as the first language or the source language, as you can say, of the researcher. And also they provide the translation in English. So both are published. Uh, this is a good thing. Another thing that we have uh, as medical institution in RCSI Bahrain, the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland, uh, we have also, we're working currently like on um, an internal medical journal, but we're trying like to start like a step by step to have it internal, local, and then going like to more regional and international. So uh, this will be a medical journal uh, trying like to have the use the peer reviewed uh, research or papers and take the permission from their authors or their organization, the publishing organization. And then we will provide the translation for the full paper. At the same time, we will provide the uh, summary of the research in Arabic. Why? This is just for the health awareness, to raise the awareness to those people like in public uh, about health, especially when it comes like from the COVID time we started actually from the COVID here to raise the health awareness for those people in public who are uh, semi-elite for example in language or their education is not I mean that much high so at least in an easy way it could suit those people like in public with who are like semi illiterate and it could also uh, benefit those people who are specialized and with well education why because we provide both the summary of the uh, peer-reviewed uh, like research or paper or publication at the same time we are having like a little bit like a hi hyperlink for those people who are like let's say here uh, well educated they can click on it and they can view the full paper in Arabic but even the Arabic language I will say if we have bilingual and if we are providing translation uh, of uh, uh, an Arabic published papers we need to have on the other side good uh, tr translators who work and also good reviewers so once it is translated by professional translators there should be also professional reviewers who will also review the translation and make sure that they, the translation is matching with the um, uh, source paper. The source paper is matching with the target uh, language paper. Uh, and this is very important, especially when it comes, I mean, to scientific, because scientific research, for example, has lots of factual things, uh, data. Uh, but uh, but I mean, when it comes to literary translation, translating literature, this is very difficult because you have to convey the same message. 
and Arabic language uh, language is very rich. So word to word translation will not do. There ne need to be like experts in the uh, translation. And this is what we need like to attract, I mean, like some entities, they can attract like a number of or group of, let's say, professional uh, translators and professional reviewers as well, with, working hand in hand with these like, uh, let's say here, researchers and authors. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much. Uh yeah, Dr. Rabat, for following up. Actually, I was going to ask that question because I thought, like, as a researcher myself, I don't think researchers do have the luxury to do two papers in two languages. It just takes a lot of time. They want to promote their, like, their knowledge in two languages, but it's just too much for them. And I was thinking probably this is the role of the publisher to be able to at least translate the summary of the abstract, or probably with extra charges, I don't know. But, yeah, but... I wouldn't actually go, it, it's just, I know a lot of research in the Arab region and within the Arab region, you have countries that are less resourced than others. Uh, obviously, Emirates is not one of them. And in that countries, knowledge of production, there is no visibility to that knowledge. And when you look at the map, none of that knowledge is indexed in this uh, index research. So, and that's because of the language. They they do have a lot of knowledge, but you don't have that bi bi-directional sort of translation that going on. I think that's very, very like a problem in, in knowledge production within the region. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Yeah. So if you ask the question I was ask, uh, going to ask Jessica about the bilingual. Bilingual means translate, I mean publishing in both languages is the same material. So did the journal discuss the possibility of having at least the abstracts yeah. translated in both languages and making it available, because yes. that will give you an indication if there is a basically um, pub, uh, publicity for the Arabic uh, research. In another word, there is uh, customers or there are viewers who would like to see those, but if it is in English, they will not be able to see. So is there any like discussion of providing at least the abstracts in both languages so that the Arabic is kind of showing to the English reader and the English is showing to the Arabic reader? Yes. That was one question. The other question was about the glossary, um, the glossary that has been already developed for the uh, for the uh, open uh, open science and open research. Um, I know there has been a number of glossaries that has been worked in different entities within the Arab region. The Arabic Network for Quality Assurance published one, the uh, DAD, uh, the German uh, um, culture, they worked with Egypt in cross-border education. But at the moment, these are, as you said, individual, not persons but entities we have the majma al lagawi al al arabiya the arabic uh, academy do these documents or these do you communicate with the arabic uh, academy in order to basically have that as a reference point to everybody so that that would be the la the, the language that is adopted i think that's my second question Um, the short answer is yes. <laughs> I love all the yes, no questions I get. Um, no, but yes, we do have um, all of our abstracts are posted in English and in Arabic. Um, so people can see that. And um, and then I, I think the, the, the most important, because then you, you're not, it's bilingual. So you don't have to be one or the, you know, in Arabic. Uh, but what, what, is, what was really indicative for me looking at the data was really about the downloads um, because the downloads are just as high as in Arabic as they are in English, right? And, and so I think that that really was showed was suggesting to me that yes, the, the readership in Arabic is really just as high or there there is sort of this this appetite and need for Arabic language articles as well, um, which was quite positive for me. Which is sad that the, there's the HTML data as well that goes entries separately, which is even higher. So I will give you that. I promise. There's even better data out there too, apparently. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Second question, I think, about the glossary um, and standardization. Yeah, 
Uh, right, like to add the second part of uh, your question, there are actually like uh, a number of initiatives, as you said, there are brilliant work like uh, done by uh, like individual entities and even like individuals as like persons or researchers. And I, I can see that because I attend myself, like uh, I attended like a number of international Arabic language uh, conferences and uh, seminars and I participated in so people are coming like from all over the world and it's not only Arabic language as a language itself the uh, especially the one like in Dubai uh, run by the uh, International Arabic Union or council uh, they opened the door like it has like sections like everything and uh, run by Arabic language like for example like even like sciences even like medicine for example uh, LRCs library and databases but through Arabic language so there are lots of initiatives uh, even like for example an impact factor initiated in Arabic an Arabic impact factor it was initiated and done by one of the Egyptian researcher and presented he presented that and showed us here the the work but still the work because it was not adopted by these like huge famous entities uh, to bring it to the international stage. And this is what we tried, I mean, through our uh, meetings with those people through these like events we try to push uh, those people to adapt it to uh, I mean uh, to it, trying like to support or to fund uh, all of these people all of these researchers and melt all of these heads like in one pot together uh, I was also participating with like a, it was like a model uh, and that model is like uh, an international Arabic academy that has a stations Arabic language for example uh, stations and they're like working stations for Arabic language research and culture and these should have like different for example each station will work not separately but all together they are like interacted and I was also trying like to put these stations in a good platform and this is what I'm also uh, trying like to work on uh, so uh, we try I mean like we would like to have this like call for these entities either like international or uh, the in the MENA region like the UNESCO and other entities will be pleased if we have these because we have the capacities we have the brains like Arab brains Lots of people are doing great job, but uh, we need here to take their hands uh, to these like international level to show their uh, real work, to show their uh, efforts, of course, here. And uh, I mean, I agree with you about the abstract, for example, as you said here, viewing the abstract also will save the researchers time. Uh, especially for collaboration, if they can view the abstract at least in their languages uh, and understand it, then they can, uh, for example, call for, let's say, collaboration and uh, try to take the full translation if they want, like per request, uh, rather than, for example, uh, reading the, the full one. And uh, uh, at the end, they find that there is no match between like both. But at the same time, uh, those authors who produce like an Arabic language, they also deserve the visibility. They deserve that their work translated in a good translation. So others, their, their work or their, for example, uh, efforts will be seen internationally and will be recognized uh, as well. Uh, so inshallah, by everybody's effort, we will, uh, we will manage to achieve. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? Many. Sorry, Batul just has a, uh, she's actually giving a webinar now and she got uh, confused about the time. So I'm taking over. Thank you. Thank you for your presentations. Just a really general question. I know that um, many countries are bilingual or multilingual. Have you come across similar research in other countries like Canada, for instance, is the obvious one that springs to mind with French and English, where different languages are dueling for you know, how they reflect society. Just wondered if you'd come across any research on that. Yes. Um, not so much in Canada, to be honest with you. The, the I would say that um, a lot, a lot of it is about the global South, I would say. 
that I've come across. Um, so you have sort of the colonial, uh, the former colonial language, and then the local language and how they seem to try to be dueling for power. Um, and, you know, one of, I, I think it's a valuable dialogue that seems to be going on in the literature. But as I said, in my presentation, in, in some ways, it's, it's a false dichotomy, right? Like you, you need to be able, we need to move past the, the finger pointing, um, and, and say, okay, well, how are we going to go and, and deal with this? Um, so I, I, it would be good. I would like to be able to see something that's happening in Canada. Cause I know there is, there's a constant, um, I, I know more of the, the education, like how is it dealt with in the education system, I would say, um, and how bilingual education is dealt with in, in, in the Canada setting. Um, but it would also be interesting to see how it is playing out with, with higher education and, and of course, knowledge production and in journals. So thank you very much. I will look. That's Tatiana. I will say it's. Uh, I'm like we're also like I'm working on these like uh, before. Uh, it's not like it's similar a little bit. I as uh, let's say here as a notion um, uh, between here the barrier between uh, Arab and non-Arab, for example. Uh, like we are like medical uh, university. So my study was like about uh, the challenges or the language barrier faced by the uh, non-Arab medical practitioners who are like practice medicine in Bahrain, like in different hospitals, private and government, and the Arab patients, especially those who are English, for example, uh, in terms of English language, they are illiterate. Uh, and the communication is lost between them. And if there are no translators, then of course here, no professional translator or interpreters, then here will be like the, uh, the barrier and there may be like medical errors or life or uh, death matters. Uh, when I was like searching in the literature, I found out that similar problem exists, but with other languages. Like for example, in the US with the Spanish, those Spanish people, not all of them, for example, like, uh, like good at English, they know only their language. Not all of them, of course, but there is like a big layer of them who came to the US. And that's why there was like a language barrier between the people there in the US and between those Spanish people, the, the, the patients, of course, and the practitioner. So I guess like so we can benefit from the literature, of course, a similar problem may exist, as you said, we may hear uh, dig more like in terms of like open access research and different languages and benefit from that and which can adopt it for like Arabic, with other languages versus other languages. That would be a great idea, thank you. I have a question. Um, I think in presentations, you mentioned that um, there is a push to publish in English because people are thinking about promotion, about impact, about visibility. And unfortunately, uh, in ideal world, it would be that researcher puts the efforts into doing research and publishing in the language they want to. But right now it's very difficult. And Trabab mentioned that um, translation tools that we have, technology tools are not ideal now. I would be quite interested, is there an effort for these commercial giants like Google to come to the region, work with Academy of the Language to improve these tools because even when we have only abstract translated, there's nothing more frustrating when you see the abstract, you want to see the article and unfortunately you understand nothing, you can't even cite it. So I think the decision will be when all these like technical translations are done in such a way that any language which is the article is published can be easily translated and seen from any part of the world because these technical tools work very well. So the question is, do you see in the region these technology specialists coming and working with language specialists to improve the, the tools? Uh, I can't, I'm like when I talk about BERD, like Google BERD, uh, it was like an article and it was like published by also, uh, there, there was like an event in UAE 
and uh, I mean they brought this to the uh, I mean like uh, uh, to the presentation uh, the the uh, and they tried it they tried like to try it but still there is no improvement needs the improvements because it's a good step I I, I will say like a first as a first step that's a good invention because uh, especially for communication but we can also use it for the written and for research. Uh, and this is what we would like like to investigate by uh, calling these like people like for example on, Go on Google who are working on this invention. Uh, that will be like a good uh, thing like a project to work with because um, it, it takes these like uh, all uh, let's say here it, it can speak in different accent Arabic accent but when it receives like any Arabic accent for example if I'm just like speaking my own accent Bahraini accent or Egyptian accent or Moroccan accent it can recognize it this is the good thing and when it replies it replies in the standard Arabic and this is a great thing because even when we teach like students we teach them first like for the beginners especially beginners through standard Arabic. Why? Because they will be confused if they are using only sticking to, let's say here, uh, one country accent, local accent. Uh, they can just like speak with the people of that country. But when it comes to, of communicating with other Arab, and here will become the, uh, I mean, like there is like a problem because they will not understand these like local uh, things, but they can uh, communicate both and understand each other through the standard Arabic. The so standard Arabic can be the language that is used for these uh, such invention like BERT. And that BERT is also uh, work with the chat GBT. And even the chat GBT has like good features and is, is used now, but still, as we said here, we need to ensure the accuracy. We need to ensure like ethical things and like cultural things. And we can step by step work like with Google if we can, I'll, I'll try like my, uh, myself, like as a person, I'll try like to reach to those people actually, because I'm very interested like about this invention, how to improve it and to bring it to the higher level, for example, of the uh, higher education and research level. So we can use it as a tool and instead of having this difficulty and translating, for example, like bilingual uh, papers, then we can use these invention to have like automatic translation, but quality translation, let's say, uh, for those people who would like to collaborate with researchers, uh, Arab and non-Arab uh, researchers, and Arab researchers also will benefit and will uh, be exposed to the to all the new things in the other world. Uh, like this, we can, I mean, uh, help. But uh, at the time being, I haven't heard like about those like famous entities having the initiative uh, of taking these like projects to become like a bigger projects and bringing it to the higher education and research level. Uh, but it is something that we can adapt also uh, from this conference and we can like if we can like create, for example, a group and we can have like a contact with those people like in uh, working like in Google about this invention in particular, how to use it. We can sit with these people or meet with them and see here how can we improve it and bring it to that level. Uh, we have the expert, but we need the uh, digital expert from them. As knowledge, we can provide, of course, and we can work with them. But as like technical and digital, this is what we need. Um, actually, I was thinking about a similar question or comment when um, when Dr. Rabab was talking, and um, AI has just. I don't know, in the last couple of weeks just entered my life in ways that I never thought possible. Um, and I've been involved in more discussions than, well, I can count. <laughs> um, but uh, most of them have been around higher education and setting guidelines um, and people being worried about sort of the uses of AI. And actually, when Dr. Robab was, was talking, it kind of sparked an idea that I was thinking, wow, maybe in a couple of years, you know, the the push for bilingual publications or something will be completely a moot conversation. Like it won't even need to exist anymore because AI will have advanced so much that people can publish in whatever language they want and then it will automatically, you know, be generated in something else. I don't think we're there yet. Um, and I am not an expert. 
um, I have trouble with my iPhone. <laughs> but it, 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 you know, it, the, based on the conversations I've had with with experts, um, I think that that is the direction it could possibly go. And I think that's a really productive use for AI in higher education that we could explore. Um, but yeah, I, actually, it was it was funny that you mentioned that because I, I was thinking something similar as well. It would also be a game changer with regards to um, publishing processes, because currently, if you have a ooh, this is way lower than I expected. Currently, if you have, if you all know, if you have your article and you co, you know, you translate it, it can be published in another journal or in another language, and so that sort of homogenization would hugely change everything. It'd be great. Certainly, make my life easier. <laughs> Um, anyway, next question. Uh, lady in the front, and then I'll lead. Along, down. Lady in black. Um, actually, I just have a small comment about the translation and the AI. AI is as good as its input. And for the translation to be good, there needs to be a huge amount of material in Arabic. I think it's a national responsibility for entities, national entities, to publish in both language. Then we have a good amount of material, and we can basically train the AI to get to make good material. Uh, I worked for an institution, Education and Training Quality Authority in Bahrain, for 13 years, and we used to publish in both languages. We had the higher education, and we did recognize that most of the higher education in Bahrain is in English. We could have chosen that, okay, we'll work in English, because that's the media that is common for everybody. But every single publication we had was in both languages, Arabic and English. It moved us to think about a glossary more and to have fixed the translation to certain terminologies. We built a glossary, a wide one. We worked with the Arab uh, Network for Equality Assurance to expand that to Arabic and English. And that's where the start will come, I think, to have a base for the AI to be able to produce good material when it comes to translation. Thank you. And that's, a, that's a very good point. Uh, Awali, your turn. Okay, so I actually had a very similar comment. Uh, AI is as good as this input. Uh, but, but I would add just that it has to be um, accessible in a legal way. So one of the issues with, with AI is copyright. And the question is whether um, the AI tools and machine learning are actually allowed legally to, to take all the content. Now, of course, in certain countries, we have fair use or fair dealing. We don't have it here. Um, so it's as good as the content it learns. And the thing is, with, with, with when it comes to Arabic, there's a huge bias in AI as well because there's a lack of Arabic content. So what I would like to add is that there should be a push not only to publish open uh, Arabic more, but to actually publish it with open licenses. Um, any other questions? Anything else? Well, uh, with that in mind, thank you all uh, in the audience uh, for your questions. I think it's it's shown the interest in this is this topic, and um, yeah, it's, there's still an awful lot to discuss. And AI, I think, does definitely open up a whole wealth of new possibilities for us to discuss next year. Um, but thank you both. Sorry, I'm going to try to. Thank you both. It's been a, a really, really uh, stimulating almost hour and a half. So thank you very much.